Praise God. Thank you for serving. Well, praise the Lord. This morning, I'll tell you, the Lord, the Lord has, has changed things up on me. He does that to me from time to time, and I don't know if that's more for you or for me, because I think he ordered this day before time was even written. He ordered this day, and yet I was preparing and going in one direction, and this morning, the Lord gave me something different. So um, when the Lord gives me a title, I, I'll give it to you. <laughs> But until then, we're going to be in 2 Kings chapter 13. 2 Kings chapter 13, and I will say that, that the Lord has been challenging me with this. And, and this, this passage of Scripture is speaking of, uh, it's, it's, we're at the end of Elisha's life. Elisha being the prophet that succeeded Elijah. And I think it's interesting how the Lord chose names that are so similar to mess with preachers as we're preaching, especially preachers that speak very fast, because often if I'm talking about both prophets, I will slip in and out of each prophet <laughs> Anyway, um, that the Lord, this is at the end of Elisha's life, and there's an encounter that he has with one of the kings of Israel. Now, this is after the, the nation of Israel had separated. So this is after um, the separation. So there was Judah, and then there was the, uh, Judah and Benjamin, and then there was uh, the rest of the tribes of Israel that remained the named Israel. Now, all, there were mostly evil kings in Judah, but there were some kings that, that turned their hearts toward God. But the Bible is very clear that all the kings of Israel, since the separation, were evil and did evil in the sight of the Lord. So this is an encounter that, that a, a, a dying Elisha has with the king of Israel, who the Bible says right in the beginning of chapter 13, I don't know if I said chapter 14, but it's actually chapter 13. Uh, 2 Kings chapter 13. In the beginning of chapter 13, says that this king, and the king is, is um, Joash. Joash um, is the king in Samaria. He's the king of Israel. And he says he did evil in the sight of the Lord. He, was, he, was, he followed all his predecessors. He, he did evil. He, he did not turn the nation of Israel or the, or the broken nation portion of Israel back to God in repentance. And yet he, he was an evil king. And, and there's this encounter on the man of God's deathbed where the king of Israel comes to see Elisha the prophet. Because what we read about in the middle of chapter 13 is that Israel was so oppressed by their enemies, that the king, Joash, turned his heart toward God. But it was one of those half-hearted turns toward God, as we talk about often in this church, and we talk, as I've been talking to you about. It was one of those insurance policy prayers. One of those things that we're in deep trouble, so let me turn to God, because Joash... Israel had a rich history of God, of knowing God, of knowing who God was and how God delivered them and how God brought them out of slavery and into this promised land where they were living now. And yet they still rebelled and turned from God. So in that rebellion that the kings of Judah, some of them were evil, but some of them, some of them were, were, they were, their heart was toward God and they turned the whole nation of Judah toward God and Israel, there was none of that. That's why the Bible was consistent in saying that none of the kings of Israel turned, were, did good in the, in the sight of the Lord. None of them followed God. They all were evil in God's, they all did evil and ran from God because there was no difference here because what happened, Joash, he said, we're in deep trouble. If, if, if God doesn't intervene on our behalf, we're, we're not going to be a nation at all. We're going to be completely gone. I'm thankful that the Lord is faithful yes. to his people, even though sometimes we're not faithful to him. Yes. That God is consistent with who he is, and he loves his people. Yes. Even when we run from him, even when we do what is evil in his sight, even when we separate ourselves from him, and even when we come back to him in that half-hearted, I don't know what else to do, so I may as well turn to God. The most irreverent way that we can come to God is that, well, nothing else is working. God, what do you got? Instead of that, I am so desperate, God, I need you, forgive me, sorry that, that I've been running from you, I need you and only you, it's that true repentance, But God is faithful in that. So in the middle of, of chapter 13, we see Joash, Joash recognize, recognizes that, that Israel's doomed. 
So he turns to God in a half-hearted way. Then he goes to see the prophet. So now we're in uh, uh, verse 14. Now when Elijah had fallen sick with the illness of which he was to die, Joash, king of Israel, went down to him and wept before him, crying, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. And Elijah said to him, Take a bow and arrows. So he took the bo a bow and arrows then he said to the king of Israel, draw the bow, and he drew it. And Elijah laid his hands on the king's hands. Verse 17, and he said, open the window eastward, and he opened it. Then Elijah said, shoot, and he shot. And he said, the Lord's arrow of victory, the arrow of victory over Syria, that's the enemy of Israel at the time, for you shall fight the Syrians in Aphek until you have made an end of them. Verse 18, and he said, take the arrows, and he took them, and he said to the king of Israel, strike the ground with them, and he struck three times and stopped. Then the man of God was angry with him and said, you should have struck five or six times, then you would have struck down Syria until you had made an end of it. But now you will strike down Syria only three times. Very interesting passage of scripture. So you've got this pretty much godless king coming to the man of God on his deathbed, the godless king is recognizing, well, I need God to intervene because then his people are going to be decimated by our enemies, Syria. So, God, so we need intervention. So let me go to the man of God because the man of God knows how to have, knows, has access to God. The man of God, before it's too late, can speak a word from God that can bring deliverance. So I'm going to go and I'm going to get counsel from the man of God. And we see that, that, that Joash, this is his last ditch effort. This is the, the insurance policy of insurance policies. Elijah's dying. The nation's in trouble. And he's saying, what else do I have to lose? So he goes and you, you read this account and you see the arrows. And you have to understand that this is all imagery. That this is, the, that Elijah's using this. And it's all imagery to, to show not only King Joash, but to show us the faithfulness of God. So this morning, out of this text, I have three action steps for us. As I often do, I have, I have a way that, that, that I believe the Lord is speaking to us that we can walk this scripture out because the Lord is faithful. The Lord is faithful. So, so for us, being the children of God, being those that have, that have received Jesus as our Lord and Savior, for those that, have, as we've been talking about, being a people of victory, being people who walk in the power of God, being a people that, that, that believe that Jesus is who he says he was, that we, that we confess with our mouths that, that God raised him from the dead, that Jesus is alive, Jesus knows exactly what we're going through, that Jesus is able to meet our needs, that Jesus is able to deliver us, that we don't, we don't fight our battles, we don't go through this life uh, uh, trying trying to win the victory, but because of what Jesus has done for us, that we fight from the position of victory because God started with the end in mind. He didn't start in the beginning and says, oh no, there's another battle. Let me see, how am I going to get them out of this? No, God started with the end in mind and then backed it all up, recognizing every struggle, every place we'd stumble, every place the enemy would attack us. And he worked our way back and he said, I sent my son and you have victory. It's done but we have to walk it out. So we don't fight from a position to earn, win the victory. We fight that we've already won. And sometimes we don't see the fulfillment of that victory on this side of heaven. Uh-oh. We don't like that, right? We want it right now. I want it right now. But it is right now. You see, we're, we're confined by time. Our humanity, we're, God created time. He's above time. In eternity, there is, no, there is no time as we understand it. And we can't fully grasp that in our, in our carnal human minds because it, these are things that are, that are just, as you start to think about eternity and you start to think about timelessness, it, it, it just, it, your mind will explode, <laughs> theoretically. We want our victory today. We want, we, but when we walk in victory, we understand through the promises of God, through what Jesus has paid for, what purchased for us, that our victory is sealed in eternity. So even though we walk through battles here, and even though we may not see every single skirmish to the victory or to the way we want to see it resolved, we know that in eternity, it's already written. It's already done. So this morning, 
Three action steps. Number one, anticipate God working through you. Anticipate God working through you. Look, look at verse 16. Then he said to the king of Israel, draw the bow, and he drew it, and Elijah laid his hands on the king's hands. That was, that, I, see, this is the problem with Joash. This is the problem with, with the, the half-in, half-out Christianity, which, by the way, there's no such thing. I think we deceive ourselves thinking that we're half in and half out or that, that there's that powerless gospel that I've been talking about. It's, it's not walking in the power of, of God. It's not walking in the life transformation of being a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. So, so we're kind of holding on to the things of this world. We're holding on to uh, the old man and we're trying to, to uh, participate in some of the things of, of being in relationship with Jesus. And I'm not talking about repetitive sins, things that we struggle with, that the Lord is helping us walk through. I'm talking about a desire in our hearts that we want to hold on to these things and not release them and let the old pass away and walk into the new that God has provided for us through Jesus Christ. But we want both. But the both is what is, is really, Jesus said in, in Revelation, that I will either have all of you or I'll have none of you. So we're deceiving ourselves when we think we can have both. So that's the insurance policy that, that really doesn't work. Can't walk in the power of God when you're holding on to the things that lead, us to, that lead to death, that lead to destruction. You can't walk in, in the freedom that, uh, of being transformed by the, by the love of Jesus Christ if we're holding on to the things that bring us to death. We have to release those things and, and put them to death and bury them once and for all and walk in the freedom we have in Jesus Christ. Freedom from what? Sin. Freedom from the sin that leads to death. Sin is anything that separates us from God. So, so this is what frustrates me about Joash and, and many of the uh, situations like this, even in our own day, is that we have this knowledge of God, but we don't have the relationship, so there's this ignorant faith. There's an understanding, but it's an ignorant faith. So Joash didn't recognize that when Elijah, the prophet of God, laid his hands on him before he shot the bow, that he was signifying the power of God working through him. He wasn't understanding that. He wasn't understanding that, listen, if you will submit yourselves to God, if you will submit this nation to God, God's power will flow through you and everything that you do in the name of the Lord, will, you will see victory. What we want, though, and what Joash wanted, I believe, is that instant miracle. The instant miracle where, where you know, like the, the, the children of Israel where they had the manna, where it's visible and it's instant. The manna was the, was the daily provision of food that came out every single morning in the morning dew. It was a coriander that was, they were to collect it and they were to, uh, it was going to be their food supply for the day. It was a visible present miracle that they had got to experience and got to receive every single day. We want that miracle where it's instant, we can see it, we can touch it, but we don't want to go collect it. We don't want to go out and collect the grain. We want it to come right into our, well, right into the oven, right out. We want it to be ready to eat. We want the ready to eat miracle. We don't want the miracle or we actually have to go and do some of the work and partner with God. That is our faith in action. To follow God in obedience, to say that I trust you, Lord, that I recognize that your power is going to work through me. That it's not going to be my power, but it's going to be your power working through me. So I'm going to take my knowledge of who you are and your promise and I'm going to walk it out and I'm going to go collect that grain. And I'm not going to collect too much because I don't want to go out again tomorrow because I know if I collect too much, it's going to get rotten on me. So the act of open up the east window, point the arrow. Now, this is, this is signifying something that happened where, where uh, invading armies would come in and they would fire the arrow, and that would be a, a, a signifying sign to the other nation that, that we're declaring war. What Elisha was doing was telling Joash... The power of God is available for you, but you're going to have to walk it out. 
you're going to have to trust him. The victory will be yours. That battle, the Syrian, they're going to be coming at Aphek. That's where they're coming. That's where you're going to fight that battle. Take that arrow, fire it out there, and I'm going to give you step by step of exactly how the Lord is going to do it. We like that step by step, by the way. I love it when the Lord gives me the step by step because I know what to expect. But I also have to understand, and you have to understand, and Joash needed to understand that God chooses the base things in life to show his unmeasurable power and glory, that he will take a small army or an individual and he will do great things through them where the people that are looking on would say, God must be doing that on their behalf because there is no other way. There is no other way. So when God chooses to use us to do God-sized miracles and God-sized feats and God-sized things that we can't even conjure up and dream on our own, People will look on to a humble heart and say, the Lord is moving in that place. The Lord is moving on that person. The Lord is moving through those people. But we miss that. We don't want to put in the effort. Or we don't want to recognize that God wants us to partner with him. God can do anything. He, he is above all things that we understand in, in the realm of physics and science and math and all of those things. He's above all those things. He can speak it into existence. He can make it so with just the sound of his voice. I love how Jensen Franklin says it. He said, with just his spittle, he created the earth. He's that powerful. We can't comprehend it. And yet he chooses to use us to accomplish his thing, the things here on this earth to advance the kingdom of God. He chooses to partner with us because he's looking for a humble people. He's looking for a people that, are, that their hearts are bent toward him so that the, the power of God would be at work through them. God is still faithful. God is still faithful. You want to know what happens next? They fight at Aphek and they, they beat the Syrians. Do you want to know at the end of Joash's life what happens? Nothing. He remained separated from God. God is still faithful, even when we're faithless. Are we going to recognize that he wants to work through us and partner with him and trust him through the process? Or are we going to lean back and say, no, God, that must not be you. That must not be you because that seems like too much effort on my part. Because I know you, God, you can do anything and you don't need me to put any effort into this. Shame on us. I'm being facetious, but I think that's how we behave. We want it easy. And the longer we travail, the longer we struggle, the more we think, oh, God, there's got to be a better way. And he's saying, just trust me. My power is at work in you and through you. He is made known by the power that is at work through us. And I love going back to David and his encounter with the giant, Goliath. David was a shepherd boy where his own brothers, his own dad before that when he was anointed king, didn't even acknowledge him as a potential candidate that God would use him as the next king of Israel. So he left him out in the field with his shepherd, with the, with, as a shepherd, left him out in the field with the sheep. And the, and the man of God, Samuel, said, none of these boys, none of these, these aren't the ones that God has selected. You don't have any more kids? He's like, well, I, I've got a son, David. He's out in the field with the shepherds, but that's not the one. He said, go get him. Bring him here. What humanity will disqualify, God calls to his service. And not only does God call to his service, God has already qualified them. And what God has called you to, God will bring you through it. So we look at David and his encounter with Goliath, and, and we see even the army looked at him, and Saul, King Saul looked at him and said, you, this can't be. And David's response, and I've shared this with you so many times, it's one of my favorite accounts in scripture because I see that's all of us all the time. We encounter these giants in our lives and we either cower back or we stand boldly with, with God on our side recognizing that there is nothing bigger than God. So David didn't care what everyone saw around him or what everybody saw in him. He saw God through the giant. He saw the power of God at work, and he saw the giant uh, disregarding the armies of the living God, and he approached him with victory already sealed. Yes. Amen. God chooses to use us and allow his power to be at work through us because when David 
accomplish that, faith was, was, was built up in the men of Israel, in the armies of Israel, because they saw God at work. If God can use David, a small, at the time, a young teenager, shepherd boy with a slingshot and a couple of stones to take down this menacing, overbearing, overconfident, strong warrior, surely God can use all of us together for his service. We have to recognize that God will work through us, that the power of God will work in us and through us to accomplish everything that he set out for us. So when, when the prophet laid his hands on, on Joash, even though Joash was, was, wasn't really wholehearted toward God, he was trying to communicate to him that the power of God will move through you. I'm here to tell you, church, the power of God is going to move, should be moving, has already moved, will continue to move in and through you to accomplish what he wants you to accomplish to advance the kingdom of God. It's not in our, in, by our ability to understand. It's not in our ability to figure it out. It's in our ability to trust God and recognize that he uses me, weak, powerless me, to do great, mighty things to exalt Jesus and point people back to him. Number two, move forward in faith. We have to trust God. We have to trust God. We can't, we can't be idle and say, okay, God, I believe, I believe that you're going to work through me. I'm going to fire that arrow. But I need you to accomplish it. No, we have to move forward in faith. Look in verse 17. And he said, open the window eastward. And he opened it. Then Elijah said, shoot. And he shot. And he said, the Lord's hour of victory, the hour of victory over Syria, for you shall fight the Syrians in Aphek until you have made an end of them. In other words, now go. The power is working through you. And you recognize that. Now go fight the battle. And don't finish until it's over. Don't stop in the middle of battle saying this is too hard. No, God, we're, 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 we're losing. It doesn't seem like we're advancing. This is, this is not, you didn't tell me this was going to happen. You didn't tell me that we were, it was going to be this bloody. You didn't tell me it was going to be this painful. You didn't tell me that, there was, it, that this was going to be the cost. Because so many times if we know the cost before we get into it, we pull back and we said, no, no, I don't want to do that. The cost is too high. He's saying, you go. I've already given you the outcome. I've already told you exactly what's going to happen. You go and you fight but you see it through to the end and you move forward in faith no matter what your eyes see. No matter what your eyes see. We struggle with trust. We struggle with trust when we have to step out in faith and we just know that God sent us and we just know in our hearts that this is the plan that God has for us. But when we're in the middle of that whirlwind battle, we really struggle with faith. Yes. It is very difficult when everything around you is saying that you missed God. And everything that you see with your eyes, with, your, with all of your senses, and even what you feel inside of your heart you feel like you missed God, and not only that, you're outside of his will and he's abandoned you. This is why I say it's so important when the Lord speaks to you and he, and he shows you things and he speaks things to your heart and he gives you dreams and, 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 and visions and, and he speaks to you through his word, that you write them down. Because when you're in the middle of those situations, it's the call of God to that very place that will anchor you where you are. Say this to ministers all the time that I've trained and I've, I've said that whenever you make a move, you have to know that God has sent you. You have to know. And it doesn't have to be a timetable on that. It doesn't have to be that I know that God has sent me for this period of time, that God sends us, he, he uses us in seasons. That there's a season, a season for, but you have to know that God has sent you there. You have to know where God is sending you because in the middle of challenges, the, the, the fight or flight inside of us will always kick in. Cut your losses and get out of there as quick as you can. You're in the middle of that battle, Joash, and there's, there, that's an opposing army in front of you. That look, and, there, and now, uh-oh, they're surrounding us. The, 
Let's get out of here while we can still save our necks. Let's cut and run. The anchor of the call of God in your life and knowing that God has sent you there is going to keep you right there in the middle of that unbelievable circumstance saying that the Lord is faithful and he will see you through it. It's always a test of faith. And it's not the Lord testing our faith. It's our circumstances around us and the Lord allowing us to go through these things. Why? To build us up. Deep calls unto deep. I've been quoting that a lot lately. The deep things of God are understood as we walk with God through every season in our lives. Our faith is often challenged when our circumstances become challenging. It's easy to follow God in faith when everything is moving perfectly still and beautiful. The waters are calm. The wind is blowing just right and we're, the boat is moving in just the right direction. and Everything is going great. It's another thing altogether when there's adversity. It's amazing how we talk about unity and how important unity is. And unity is, is awesome when everybody is on the same page. But when there's disagreement, that's the test of unity. That's the test of unity when people are in disagreement and are we going to move forward or are we going to be at a standstill and we're going to argue and we're going to go backwards because we're going to be in argument about this. It's the same thing with our faith. We're going to move forward and believe in God, recognizing what we just talked about, that we move in the power of God, that his power is at work through us, but when we get into those and we move forward in faith and as we're moving forward in faith, when we face those battles... And things look really, really bleak. And things look like, I, I don't even know how we're going to get through this. Faith is what keeps us moving forward, one step in front of the next one. And it's not faith that we can generate by willing that in, our, in and of ourselves. It comes out of real, true relationship with God. Amen. When we are with him, when we have relationship with him, when I spend time with him, when I invest time with him, I can trust him because I know him and he knows me. When we don't have relationship with him and we're just going on a whim, it becomes very difficult. I would imagine for Joash, it must have been very challenging for him to walk this out, to fight that battle in Aphek. It must have been very, very challenging for him because he didn't have that deep-rooted relationship with God. He went on the words of the prophet, who, by the way, right after this passage in the next verses, he dies. He died. So you know that's going through his mind as he's in the middle of that battle. He's dead. What if that word died with him? What if, so he didn't have that the way we have it now, where we have the, 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 the availability of relationship with Jesus that, actually, that was available to Joash. He chose not to walk in it. He chose not to have the relationship with God. His heart was far from God. But when our hearts are close toward God and our hearts are bent toward God, he gives us that faith, that supernatural faith to take the next step, yes. to remain grounded, to keep moving forward. It's not something that we conjure up. It's we trust God and it's by the power of the Holy Spirit. Finally, number three, don't limit God. Don't limit God. In the next, the strangest passage of scripture in verses 18 and 19 and he said take the arrows and he took them and he said to the king of Israel strike the ground with them and he struck three times and stopped then the man of God was angry with him and said you should have struck five or six times then you would have struck down Syria until you had made an end of it but now you will strike down Syria only three times very very interesting passage of scripture when you think about this imagery and like God, what, what, are you, what are you doing? Why wouldn't you just tell him what to do and let him do it? Because God already had given him instructions with the first battle. He said, listen, this is how it's going to go down. This is what's going to take place. You're going to have to fight. Just see it through. You know the end from the beginning. Now, I want you to trust me the rest of the way. Those arrows that you have, it's going to be imagery. Those arrows, I want you... He didn't say how many... Elijah didn't say. He said, take those arrows. Look at the, the exact words. He said... And he said, take the arrows. No specific number. He said, take the arrows. As people of God, we can't limit God by what we understand. Like, I don't understand God. Why, am I, why fire these arrows? What am I? All right, here's one. 
oh, this is weird. This feels weird. Here's, two, here's three. Good? No, not good. Fire them all. God is bigger than our limitations. God is bigger than what we perceive as a limitation. Because if, if, if Joash would have had a true relationship with God, if Joash would have been humble before God, maybe he would have grasped the spiritual discipline here of trusting God and saying, listen, I've got, I've got 12 arrows left. I'm going to fire every single one of them because God is bigger than what I can see. God is bigger than what I can understand. So I'm going to fire every arrow into the ground, recognizing that each arrow is a victory. Each arrow is a victory. We can't win 15 times. No, you absolutely can with God on your side. So we limit God by our understanding. We limit God by not knowing all the details. God, what in the world does this have to do with arrows? I'm talking about an enemy that's coming in and you want me to shoot arrows? Are we going to trust him like we just talked about? Or are we going to try to reason with him? I said it to you last week. We don't serve the God of answers. We serve the God who, who gives us the promises. He doesn't say, I'm going to give you all the answers. He says, trust me. We serve the God who is trustworthy. So are we going to trust him and say, you know what? He said, fire the arrows. I'm going to fire every single arrow. I have no idea what this means. I'm going to fire every arrow. I'm going to... And I believe more understanding would have come as a result of that. We limit God by our understanding or lack of understanding. Trust me, I've shared this with you. I've been very transparent about this. I love to know the beginning from the end. God doesn't give me that, preview, that privilege. He wants me to trust him more than I know how to do things. We limit God by what we understand, by our, our lack of knowledge, lack of understanding. We say, well, this is, just, this is just different. This is just weird. Why am I firing these arrows? And basically, it came down to this. You would have made a complete end to your enemy if you would trust the limitless power of God. But because you weren't trusting his limitless power, because you weren't, didn't understand everything and you couldn't maybe understand why this was taking place, but because of that, you're gonna win some battles now. But you're not gonna put an end to this enemy. In other words, this enemy is gonna be a thorn in your side for the rest of your reign as king. I wonder how many skirmishes continue in our lives because we're limiting God. I wonder how many things we're still struggling with, how many areas of our life in our walk with Christ or in our relationships or in this world around us that we, that we struggle, we continually struggle with because we limit the power of God at work on our behalf. We limit him and we put him in this box where God has no limits. God is boundless. Well, you're saying, well, he's God, so why is he limited by us? Because it's our faith that we just talked about that will determine how we move forward. So if we're going to say we're going to trust God, but only if he shows me and gives me exact instructions, is that really trust? Is it trust if he has to lay it all out for us and spoon feed us each step along the way? Yes, I need the spoon feeding, but he's not going to give it to me in advance. Sometimes he says, just take the next step and I'll give it to you. I'll give you what you need. Amen. And sometimes he says, take the step and then I'll bring, you the, I'll bring you what you need later. Just know that I'm there with you through it. We limit God. And as a result of limiting God, we limit the power at work through us, which goes back to what we talked about before. God is limitless. He's not, he's not bound by the things we're bound by. He's not confined to time. He's not confined to our, 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 our ingenuity. He's not confined to our abilities. He's not confined to our resources. He's not confined to any of that, and yet we do it to him all the time. We put him in our box, in our limitations, in our understanding, and we say, oh God, why aren't you moving on our behalf? He's saying, because I'm moving inside. You want me to move inside of what you can't, are able to do, and I have something so much bigger for you. I have so much more planned for you. Would you just let me loose and let me do what I... We don't, we don't keep God restricted. You don't understand what I'm saying here. Let me loose in your spirit. In other words, trust me to move on your behalf. To move on your behalf instead of limiting what I'm able to do with small faith. And he said the faith, the size of a mustard seed, Jesus said, can move mountains. That, here's the thing about faith, the size of a mustard seed. It's the sincerity of our trust in him. It's not about the quality. It's about do we truly trust him? Do we, do, we, do we believe that he is bigger than what we can, we can see, what we can understand, what we can fathom? 
Trust in the Lord, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will keep your path straight. Do we believe these scriptures? Do we believe these promises of God? Or are they just nice sayings that we like to quote to make us feel better? Are we going to grab hold of those promises, cling to them, and know that God is able? Beyond our understanding, we lean on our understanding. The, 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 the scripture is very clear. We lean, we put our weight on what we can understand. We put our weight on it. And he says, don't lean on that, lean on me. Lean on God, lean on his understanding, lean on his power. Don't lean on what you can because you will fall over. If I put enough weight on this, it will collapse. If I put enough weight on what I understand, it will collapse but I can put everything on God and he will never falter. He will never collapse. Don't limit God. Don't limit God by your limitations. We are very much limited. We are very much tethered to our confines of what we're able to do, but he said, Jesus said, he said, when I go, you will do not only do what I'm able to do, but greater works Greater works. Do we understand what greater means? Jesus did unbelievable things here on this earth. And he says, you will do greater works. Why aren't we doing greater works? Because we're limiting him by what we're able to do. If we walk by the, the, the lame beggar at the gate beautiful, at right after Jesus ascended to heaven, come on, let's, let's take our spiritual highs. When we have those encounters with God and we are on those spiritual highs and we come across that lame beggar at beautiful, do we reach in our pocket and give him the change, ignore him, or do we do what Peter and John did, full of faith, saying, I don't have any money. What I have, I'm going to give to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Get up and walk. Yes, greater things, greater things, greater things. And we say some of the things, smaller things, powerless things. Jesus said greater things. I want greater things. I don't want to limit God anymore. I don't want to limit God by, by, by what I see, my ability, what, I, what I'm able to understand. I don't want to limit God anymore. I don't want to limit God by what we, by, by, I don't want you to limit God by what you see, by what you struggle with. He sees your struggles. He knows what you're going through. I talked about this already. Jesus knows exactly what you're going through. He knows your struggles. Just trust him that he's not limited by what you're struggling with. He's not limited by your circumstance. He's not limited by that giant that stands in front of you. He is not limited. But we walk with limitations all the time. I believe the Lord wants to give us a fresh understanding of this as we've talked about the powerless gospel. As we've talked about a generation of people growing up with many people that say that they know God, but they've not seen the power of life transformation happen in their families' lives, and so they're not believing it. I believe that if we grasp what the Lord is speaking to us today and we start to walk it in the limitless power of God, that we will shake this region for the glory of God. If we humble ourselves and we get on our faces, do you understand that this whole process that, that Elisha is taking uh, uh, Joash through, Joash through, he's taking him through this process, it looks like travail in prayer, doesn't it? If you take a step back and you, from the full counsel of Scripture and everything that we've been talking about and everything that we've learned through Scripture, it, it looks like he's talking about prayer. He's talking about travailing in prayer to trust God. He said, listen, there's your enemy coming. Open up the window, cry out to God. He'll deliver you. And he's saying, not only that, he says, I want you to continually cry out to me and continually seek my face and continually trust me. Don't trust me for the thing that seems bigger than you right now and then something that you think is within your ability. Trust yourself. He said, trust me through everything. So travail in prayer. That be a people who know how to get to the heart of God by getting on your faces and humbling yourself and knowing that God is at work through you. We want to shake, we want to reach this nation for God. We want to reach this, this city for God and the surrounding cities for God. And yet our, our involvement with God is, is limited to just that, involvement, not commitment. I've shared this a few Wednesdays ago. I have referenced it a little bit last week that Jesus said to daily pick up your cross and follow me. That means every day I'm going to lay aside 
my struggles, my, 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 my plans, my goals, my dreams, all that stuff, and I'm going to lay it aside to follow you, Jesus, saying your will, not my will. I'm going to follow you no matter what. But we're at a place, I think, in our society, and I believe we're at, we're at a pivotal point in time. In the history of time, we're closer today to Jesus' return than we've ever been. And I know that that sounds like a trite statement because every day that goes by, we're a day closer to Jesus' return. So that's, that goes without saying. But I, I truly, you look at, Jesus said, look to the skies, look to what's happening, all the signs, everything that's taking place is, is, is preparing the way for the Lord's return. And he's not coming for a church that is, that is half in, half out. He's not coming for a people that are, that are involved and not committed. He's coming for a church that is spotless, that is white, that is, that is washed by his blood, that is committed to his cause, that is, that is uh, believing him, that is not limiting him, that is trusting him. He's looking for a church that's saying that, uh, and I'm talking about now the, the church universal, the, the, the people of, of, of Christ, the, those that are followers of Christ. We are the church, that are, are people that are, that are committed to the cause of Christ, that are committed to him, that are committed to, to, to the lost and dying world around us, that we're not uh, committed to uh, ourselves, committed to making ourselves feel good. And how do I make myself feel better? How do I, how do I get just enough of God to have access to heaven, but not enough that I have to be uncomfortable in this life? That's the, that's the problem with our society today. That's exactly what we're saying. We want just enough of God to have access, but we don't want to die to ourselves for it. Amen. He's looking for a church that is willing to lay everything down for him. And we do that because we're limiting God. We want to satisfy ourselves because we're limiting God. I've said this before, and I'll say it again, and I'll continue to say it, that I don't think when we're on the other side of eternity, or when we're in eternity, that we're going to look back and say, my goodness, I wish I, wish I would have spent more time on me for those, those few moments that I was on earth. I wish I would have spent more time on me. I think we're going to be, and I think that's where it says he's going to dry every, every tear and, and wipe away the tears, because we're going to look back and we're going to say, oh, the missed opportunities the missed opportunities to advance the kingdom, the missed opportunities. I'm in this situation, Holy Spirit, I, I don't want to engage this person right now. I, I've got to do this. I've got some place to be. This is inconvenient if I talk to this person right now, but we don't know if that's the last time they're going to have be on this earth. We don't know if you're the last conversation before eternity. And what if you were the gatekeeper? What if you were the one that God wanted to use and we walk away from that because we're inconvenienced? God, help us for limiting him. God, help us. It's not about our comforts. And yes, he blesses us. And yes, he, he, he takes care of us. But there is no joy like the joy of being in the will of God. We can't, we have to stop limiting God. Stop limiting him to, to what we want. To what we desire. To our feel-good Christianity. Our feel-good faith. Yes, he wants us, to, there's joy unspeakable and full of glory, but when we distort that and make it about us, we miss it. We miss it. It's about him and his goodness and his mercy. We're powerless because we're faithless. We're powerless because we limit God. Because we've not allowed him to change our lives and to walk in that change when things are challenging for us and uncomfortable. When we take the, take the limits off of God in our lives and in our thinking and stop leaning on our understanding, I believe we will see God move in power in our lives and in the world around us. And guess what? We're probably not going to be celebrated for it. And that's okay. As long as Jesus is celebrated. As long as it goes back to him. Because there's going to come a moment, if we walk in this and we follow him faithfully, that there'll be a crown of righteousness 
when we are in heaven and we will have that opportunity to take that crown and throw it at the feet of Jesus, saying, it's all about you, Jesus. It's not about me. Stand with me this morning. So this morning...